and I show up on 18 and I was like, wow, dude, listen, if you make Burry on the last, you got to probably go to the PJ Tour next year. All right, four players in my Barstool Sports. I'm talking a little bit weird because I'm at the Admirals Club at the Charlotte Airport right now. It's a little bit loud in the background. I'm going to mute when I'm not talking. Um, we got a hell of a show. we got two interviews in the show. Is that right, Dan? Two interviews, number eight and number nine in the FedEx Cup standings. We went back-to-back. You know, that's how we do it here. Yeah, well, back-to-back action. Um, I'm leaving Myrtle Beach. i got to catch a quick three flights today to get out to Palm Springs. We're going to have a delightful time at the Barstool Classic. I'm going to see Dan. I'm going to see a bunch of Taylor made guys there. Um, but, yeah, we got two two interviews. we got Pavon and we've got Ben on. Those are the two interviews. Is that correct? Those are the two interviews. Benny on, who is sneaky, a beauty. Really, really like Ben on. He's having the best year of his career. And then Pavone was playing in Europe last year, got hot at the end of the year. He won Torrey Pines. He finished 12th in the Masters. Again, these, both these guys are in the top 10. And I was honestly just looking down the FedEx Cup list, and I was like, who have we not had on the show? And those were the two highest guys, I think. So there you go. Yeah, I mean, that's a win. we got a couple guys on the show. We had them. Um, I, I walked yesterday. I was at, at the Myrtle Beach Classic. Awesome time. We got kids. We got... Joel Damon had dinner with the two of them last night at Alistair, and it was just an unbelievable time with those two. I love them to death um, with all those guys, really. But um, Brandon Wu, who I had forgotten we had on the podcast like three years ago, who's an awesome guy, was in the group with Alistair and Joel Damon, and he went to Deerfield Academy, which is the rival of the high school that I went to. And you just kind of forget how many people you have on the show over the years. So it's awesome that we obviously get those two guys. Um, excited to listen to those two. Big shout out to Myrtle Beach. It's the first tour that they've ever had, which is insane. I know they call it, we call it golf capital of the world. We go nuts about play golf. Myrtle Beach, we've done a ton of stuff down there. Um, for that to be the first tournament, PGA Tour tournament that they've ever had was surprising to me. I just couldn't believe that fact. Um, they've got a cool field. I mean, it's opposite field, obviously. Um, so it's not, you know, it's not what's going on at Wells Fargo yet. They've had incredible ticket sales. I think they're going to sell out for Saturday. Um, which is awesome. They got concerts on the beach. So really fun time being there. It's very fun. Like we've done it a couple of times with the Wyndham championship with you guys were at RBC heritage, which I know is an elevated event, but we've done zero classic, just going to events that aren't necessarily the master's tournament and players championship. They pre- appreciate so much when you go there. Um, and they kind of roll out the red carpet and make sure you have a great time and you can see how hard all of these people are working on the event behind the scenes to make it as cool as it can possibly be. And you just kind of forget how much goes into it and how special it is for the people that live in that area. Uh, and the Myrtle Beach Classic, it was just incredibly awesome to see that. It looks amazing. Uh, Myrtle Beach just gets it done now uh, in terms of like what they're doing with the with the um, influencers and now what they're doing with the PGA Tour. It seems like they're understanding like the new way of where um, golf is going and what better place to do it than like the number one golf destination in America at this point. Um, Actually, I was I've been like deep on the golf Reddit. I, I never like looked at the golf Reddit and there's like some really good like debates and stories on there where people get into it. Um, I'm sure that there's a lot of podcasts out there that pull from there. Um, but someone actually asked, like, what's like the sneaky what's the sneaky best golf town in America that no one really talks about? And a lot of people are getting into like huge debates about that. It's just like when Dave will, will show up to a place and they'll be like, you got to try my pizza spots, the best pizza in the country. And he's like. You're the 90th person to tell me that today. Everyone has a local pizza spot that they love. Um, but Myrtle Beach, it always is at the top of the rankings. And the fact that, um, yeah, they're getting the PGA Tour love now is incredible. What are a couple of the heavy hitters for golf towns that are on the golf Reddit? <sighs> Maybe I should have had those written down, Trent. Um, All right. I, I'll be honest. I thought that's where we were going, but that's okay. No, no. I, I, I wanted to finish up the Myrtle Beach talk, and then I'll bring that up for sure. Um, I just have to scroll. But, yeah, right. I, I, it, it was a lot, right? It's like it was a thousand there was a thousand submissions and I don't know that there sure. was a consensus on like, which one was the best one. I guess uh, it wouldn't be Reddit if there was a consensus. I could right. see Scottsdale being a big one. Um, that was the top answer that had that yeah. most, that had the most upvotes. It's just got the biggest combination of like nightlife, fun stuff to do. You can do a pool party one day and a golf 36 holes the next day. So I could see Scottsdale being up there for sure. There was one guy also looking for the, the, the easiest golf course in America. He was looking for like a slope, <laughs> Or like a rating of like 55. I think it's like the lowest you could possibly go. I like that. Yeah, dude. People put um, um, Sheep Ranch up there as the easiest course in America. I, I had one of the best rounds of my life, though. There's no bunkers there. Um, I think Mammoth Dunes, where we played in, uh, in Sand Valley, was one of the easiest golf courses. I mean, obviously, like if the wind's blowing and stuff, but the, as far as just pure width, it was very difficult to lose a golf ball there. Is that how you like 
you know, determine if it's the easiest golf course is just like the width off the tee. That's that's a big one for me because I feel like if it's so wide, then you're if you're always going to have a shot at the green, then that's really going to limit your like triple bogeys, right? Yeah, I think I, as a guy with plenty of experience, I think for an amateur weekend ish golfer, if you're losing balls off the tee is the number one way that you lose a lot of strokes. I mean, some players sure around the green, but generally across the board, I would say off the tee, people just lose so many strokes in the water. Hit it out of play. You hit it into the trees. You hit it into the brush, and you're just a stroke and a half behind on the hole immediately. Whereas at Mammoth, I mean, the fairways are 150 yards wide at that point. This episode is presented by Chevy. With golf season in full swing, Chevy wants to help you make the most of every drive, and the all-electric Blazer EV. Bold design and dynamic performance make it the perfect electric vehicle to get you to the course in style and comfort. We've seen the Blazer EV. We have had our hands on the Blazer EV. It's an amazing piece of technology, Trent. It is an amazing piece of technology. You said something last episode where you were just saying, like, they're just vehicles at this point. Like, we're going to get to a point where it's all electric vehicles, mostly in any way, and that's going to be the dominant, where that's just going to be vehicles and Chevy. As we've talked about, they've been doing it for 10 years. They've got the best vehicles. They've got the Blazer EV. They're at the forefront of this whole thing. Yeah, they're just magnificent, magnificent vehicles that are going to take us into the future. At the forefront at the forefront that has earned them the prestigious honor of being named Motor Trend's 2024 SUV of the year. Motor Trend, who gave out this award, also judged big, small, gas, hybrid, electric vehicle, and luxury SUVs. Blazer EV beat all of them. They have the unique styling, comfort-driven interior, incredibly smooth ride, and responsive handling. I'm telling you right now, go check it out. Go to a Chevy dealer. Go check out this Blazer EV. Head over to Chevy.com slash Blazer EV to check it out. Check out lease office, officers. Lease offers. Are people that give out lease offers officers? Yeah. So go see a lease officer and get a lease offer and other amazing deals at Chevy.com. Chevrolet. Together, let's drive. I have an update on golf trip uh, locations. Please, Number exactly. one, resp- so Scottsdale was up there, but it was it was like thrown in with like I know that the Scottsdale, the Myrtle Beaches, and the Austins, etc. It, it was thrown in with the etcs, and he didn't want that as an answer. So the top looking answer for like one that people don't know about, right? It's the Alabama Robert Trent Jones Golf Trail is the number okay. one. Sneaky, the best they're saying. Uh, many many beautiful and challenging golf courses. Enough tee boxes to accommodate any level player. Um, just do not plan a trip there during the summer. We have to make a, we, we, we've been wanting to do a travel series there, um, yep. because those courses look incredible, but I guess it's so fucking hot in the summer. Um, the second top was Williamsburg, Virginia. Lots of great quality golf there with a ton of upvotes. Syracuse and Rochester, New York. I played up in Rochester and I told you guys that place is like, uh, where did I play? Uh, uh, Adonio. Is, is that what it's called? Alex, you're a fucking upstater. Arondacoy? Or are you talking Arondacoy. about Arondacoy? Yeah. Arondacoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Arondacoy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ado- Adoin you was Arondacoy? No, 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 no. Nailed it, dude. Nailed no, it. no. Adunio. You asshole. It's it's that um casino. The Adunio. That's what it's called. It looks like Atunyoit. Remember I played there and I was saying it incorrectly and someone's like, it's actually Adunio. It's a... It's just like a resort golf course um, next to a, a casino. Place is fucking phenomenal. I think they had a PGA Tour event there within the last 20 years. Place is absolutely phenomenal. No matter where you look in Rochester, you can get this ridiculous, obviously, full foliage, fall foliage during the fall in Rochester, upstate New York. Phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. All, all Alex Bush did there was just insert the name of his home club that he grew up at. Correct. As Correct. The course. I just thought you right. fucked up the name again. Oh, but. I heard a course in Rochester. It's got to be a run to coin. <laughs> Great. Um, but yeah, it was a cool little thread to like go, and I think a lot of people appreciate it because a lot of these resorts also are so expensive, and a lot of them are impossible to get on. So when you get a list of like a hundred different places that you can maybe book a buddy's trip, I thought that was a pretty useful um, thread. Riggs, speaking of Charlotte, I know you're, I know you're just in transit. I know you're not going to Wells Fargo, but there is some drama brewing over at Wells Fargo. It, it sure seems like Patrick Cantlay and Rory McIlroy fucking hate each other. They hate each other. <laughs> I missed all this. Hit me with this. Hit me with this. So, so remember, I reported this like right after Rom left that Cantley had like kind of seized control, like he was kind of the guy calling the shots. And then Rory, soon thereafter, 
leaves the policy board, gives all these quotes about, I think he said like Patrick is a dick. I think he said something. There was, there was quotes that came out. So he leaves the policy board and then he comes, he, he said like two weeks ago that he was going to come back. And then today they asked him and he was like, yeah, you know, some people just really had an issue with me coming back to the policy board. You know, it just, I think it's better if Webb stays. And then there were some quotes that some tournament director came out that were like, yo, we need Rory. This is what I was, what I was reporting months ago. We need Rory because he's the only one with the balls to counteract Patrick. And if I think he said maybe neuter Patrick. And if we don't get Rory back, then Patrick is just going to run free. It's interesting that the reason that Cantlay doesn't seem to want him back, or he, I think Rory said there's a subset of people on the policy board who are uncomfortable with me returning. And then he was like, for some reason. And the reasoning, it seems, is Rory wants to get a deal done and the other guys do not. Rory has completely, the whole thing is flipped on Rory, where originally, obviously, he's like, I hate live, it's dead in the water, all those things. And now he can't return to the policy board because he's the only guy in the room who is like, we have to get a deal done. And Cantlay does not want a deal done. So he's like, I don't want Rory back on the policy board. That's what it seems like. Dan, would you concur with that? Because I, look, Yeah, I, I, I think there's a subset of guys who feel like they need a deal right now. Or a subset of guys, Rory is sort of the face of that, who feel like they need a deal right now. And that every successive week without a deal damages the sport and damages the game. I don't know if Cantlay doesn't want a deal at all, but I think, and Spieth kind of hinted at this in some quotes where he said, you know, we have money now from S from strategic sports group. I'm not so sure that we need a deal right now. You know, why don't we focus on making our tour better and making this? And Rory's like, no, 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 no. There is no making our tour better unless we have a deal. Right. Because the money coming in, that's not Saudi money makes it better for the players. Certainly the, the purses are higher. There's money in the tour. But I don't think that does much for the fan. Like the and fan I, doesn't give a fuck about that. I think, and I've been saying this a lot. You know, you, I'm sure the same as you guys. You get asked this question all the time. What do you think about live golf? What do you think about live golf? And my number one answer right now is it's the, the whole thing has certainly been better for the players, like on yeah. both sides. The players are the ones who have who have benefited most from this because the, the the power and the money has swung so heavily in their direction. And I think it can be hard if well, you're the richer and players, you're, the bigger, better players are definitely benefiting. I think there's like right. a I, right, I think there's now a thicker line than there's ever been, and if you're on the wrong side of that line, you're kind of looking at getting fucked. And you're playing, you know, if you're playing, I mean, there's no secret. I love the Myrtle Beach thing. I was going crazy about it. Like, if you're playing an opposite field event now, you know, your opportunity cost, all of that, is right there. It's apparent. It's like these other guys are guaranteed X amount of money. The purses are way, way higher. They're playing more of those events. You're not even really playing on the same PGA Tour. You're almost playing on a different tour because. Like you said, Dan, like the Scotty Shufflers and the Wyndham Clarks and all those who Wyndham's done like kind of a complete 180 on it, where like a year ago, he had one ever on the PGA Tour. And now he, a few months ago, was like, we kind of need to limit the fields. But at this point, like if you're playing in these events, you almost never play against the Scotty Scheffler or Wyndham Clark or Rory McIlroy because those guys are playing the majors. They're playing the elevated events. That's pretty much it. That's all that they're yeah, playing. No, so if you're, right. if you're one of these other guys like Brandon Wu, who, again, I was out there with yesterday, like... He's really not playing almost any tournaments against against Scotty Shuffler all year long. Yeah, same same with, same thing with Joel. Like, funnily enough, but you're right. So for the better players, it's gotten better. So it takes a certain selflessness because if you're if you're someone in Patrick Cantlay's shoes and you're just looking in your direct surrounds, you're like, fuck, it's pretty good right now, right? I'm yep. making more money than ever. I'm playing less tournaments than ever. I, you know, from a from a personal standpoint, things are going super well. And then the Rory's kind of like, well. We got to think about the guys, people who are actually consuming the product, which is which is speaking to what Trent is saying. On the other side of the um, the split tours conversation, where like the elevated players are all playing in the elevated events, doesn't that present an opportunity for the not as skilled or successful players to like play in these side tournaments and earn points and earn their way into these top sixties and seventies by playing against like lesser strength fields and like. They have opportunities to win when they didn't win the Scotties and the Rory's and the Spieths were all playing in it. I think so, but the issue is it's not like the Scotties and Rory's and all them aren't playing at all this week. They're just playing in a way bigger tournament with a way bigger purse that these other guys are into. So for a lot more points and FedEx and all that. So right. I, I, I guess you're right. Like you don't have to go up against as stiff a competition, but it, you could also say that about guys on the Corn Ferry Tour. You're like, oh yeah, don't they have a great opportunity because they're just not playing right. against the best right. player? It's like, well, yeah, they're just on a worse tour. And, and the they're not playing skewed. for as much money. Right. And the points are very skewed. So it's like finishing third in Myrtle Beach is probably like equal to finishing like 12th or something in Wells Fargo. Right. 
Yeah, it's a tough conversation. I don't know what the answer is, and I'm sure that's why p- professional golf doesn't know what the answer is for the last couple of years. But like, at some point, you had to just value the top guys. No one gives a fuck, especially the viewer. No one gives a fuck about whoever's number 87. Like, no one cares, and that's just a reality situation. No one's ever cared about number 87 in any wor- walk of life. You know what I mean? It's just like you got to make it to the top for anyone to like pay to see you or whatever it might be. So whoever's number 87, by the way, is catching strays. But uh, at the end of the day, you just got to you got to cater to these guys that are bringing in the dough. No, you you do. And it's you know, I mean, I think Joel said it at dinner last night. We were having a very similar conversation about this last night. And it was interesting hearing from those guys. And every time we would kind of make the point of like, ah, some guys are getting left in the dust. You and kids are playing your best right now. You might get left in the dust. He would say like, hashtag play better. And it, you know, yeah, it it's, is, it's as simple as that. I mean, in any of, other sport, that's correct too. Like, even team sports, where I mean, are you supposed to cater to the guys that just like aren't producing, or do you give the biggest contracts to the best players? I mean, it's I don't know. It's it's yeah. weird in golf. The, and it feels like guys are getting singled out, but it's like just like play better in the tournaments. I guess I don't know. Well, people, when when people are saying, oh, you know, it's better for the for the top players, it's better for the stars. That's just another word for better golfers. Oh, it's better for the guys that are winning. Listen to what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, SH Kim, by the way, number eighty-seven. No, no disrespect to SH Kim, but, but no, kind of is, actually, kind of actually, a great example for what you were saying, right? <laughs> Who the hell? Yeah. No, I, yeah. it is like it's almost the same conversation we have about the Barstool Classic when people bitch about the fifty percent handicap, but they're like, I feel like that really favors the better golfers. I'm like, yeah, it's a golf tournament. The guys that are better at the yeah, golf that's what have happened. an advantage. It's a golf tournament. That's like right. what we're doing. It's like you're playing three on three basketball, and you were like. I feel like this format really favors that guy who's really good at basketball. Yeah, get no shit for playing basketball. Right. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> you can't so cater kind of sports and events and all these things to the guy that like isn't as good as the top guy to like make them have a better life or day. Like in, in terms of the Barcelona Classic, like you can't you can't cater it to that person that's like, oh, like I just don't have a chance today. It's like listen to what you just said. I don't know what has happened in your life to get to that point where you don't have a chance to beat anyone else in a golf tournament but that's not our fault we're just hosting the event we got a ton of trulies we've got a lot of music we've got some fun events but if you're not good enough to win against like your peers and whoever may show up i don't know what else to tell you about that and that the the same goes for the pga tour well right it's like (laughs) dude i'm looking at you you got four limbs you've been to a driving range before you got 14 golf clubs and this other guy's just better at it than you are so he's probably Uh, got an advantage we see off like i don't know what to tell you um and it is kind of the same thing with the tour Did you know that you can get a ticket to a New York Yankees game against a uh, Houston Astros who the Houston Astros are like dead now. I don't know what happened to them. I think the Yankees sweeping them to start the season really set them off on a tizzy, but you can go to a New York Yankees game for $8 tonight at Yankee wow. Stadium on the Game Time app. Unbelievable price. That's right. With Game Time, the official ticketing partner of Barcel Sports, finding tickets for less has never been easier do not worry about tickets to your next uh a big event don't stress over it game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets to any of the events you're trying to go to sports music comedy theater events anything near you they've got it they have flash deals for sudden discounts they have zone deals for when you're feeling flexible their lowest price guarantee which means that you have um if you can find the same seat less for uh, anywhere any other app or whatever game time will credit you 110 percent of the difference did you hear what i just said i did if you find a price no matter where you find it on any of these other sites game time's going to give you that credit 110 percent of the difference wow that's how confident they are basically guaranteeing that they have the lowest price that's what they're doing that's how confident they are what are you waiting for i'm gonna absolutely have you know what i want to go to a yankee game (coughs) and uh and this week might be that this this might be it Astros at Yankees for $8. I think I'm going to have to do that. So I'm going to head over to Game Time. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code 4 for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Download the Game Time app today. And I have a little thing in front of these last words here. That's last minute tickets. Lowest price. Guaranteed. All right, we're going to do, we got to do a little closest to the pin action. I do want to say before we get to wow. that. Um, and I know who brought closest to the pin today? I is did. That Trent Ryan. Trent Ryan's got that, um, which is brought to you by Fireball. We're going to talk about Fireball. Um, speaking of fire, real quick, and again, I'm at the Admirals Club here. I'm kind of in public. 
but I just have to make a comment here. As a heterosexual male, American male, I simply have to comment and say that I thought Nelly Corda looked amazing in her Met Gala outfit. I thought okay. she's on top of the world. She's won five events in a row, including a major championship. She's the number one player in the world by a mile. And then everything that she did, congratulations. She nailed it. I saw that picture on Golf Digest. She just reposted it this morning. And I thought in my head, wow, Nelly Corda looks stunning. So congratulations to Nelly Corda. She's on top of the world right now. I would be remiss if I didn't comment on it. Yeah, I totally great. agree. I totally agree. I mean, that as crazy as it sounds, like that's huge for the LPGA Tour that like their best player, maybe of all time, is also able to go to something like the Met Gala and just like completely steal the headlines and be all over magazines. And like, she is like the girly girl also, and then dominating her female sport. And that's something that I feel like is not too common where it's like they either, they like decide on either one or the other. Um, She's got everything, man. She's fucking, she's a unicorn. She's wild. The Met Gala takes over social media almost unlike anything else outside of the Super Bowl, And it's, uh, it's they just walk by and then there's is there something after it or is it just no it's a di- that's it's it. a dinner behind closed doors and they raise a ton of money for the met got it okay I mean, nelly's got to be the first lpga player to ever attend the, met the Gallery. only other golfer to ever attend is tiger woods yeah wow that. yeah that like 2013. is 2013 wow Big time. I yeah know that. yeah i didn't and yeah. i mean Tiger was a handsome cat in his day and still a handsome guy. But I think she, t- I mean, she looked stunning. I think she could have, she fit in with any celebrity out there. I thought she just absolutely nailed it. That's a five tool weapon right there. Is that we call <laughs> it a five tool. To- I mean, <laughs> she killed it. Five tool player, amazing. Nelly Corda. She, yeah, just, she just nailed it. So whatever is her he- dress choice, her makeup choice, the hair, all of it, she just nailed it. I thought she looked Is the great. LPGA benefiting from Nelly Corda? the way that like the WNBA is benefiting off of Caitlin Clark right now. Like what, what's the, what's their issue that they're not cashing in on having someone that's winning every single week. So I played with the commissioner last week or two weeks ago in the pro-am for the, uh, I played in the pro-am for the JM Eagle championship. The LPGA was in LA They're They don't have a very good media deal. They are on tape delay uh, this weekend, which is insane. That, that's a thing in 2024. They're on tape delay on golf channel. <laughs> Um, what is it? So, 1994. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, like you're just not. No one's just. No one's going to check who won. The, who won the tournament? And no one's going to look it up online. Are they going to tape delay the leaderboard online? Also, um, you yeah. know, like my dad's going to love that. He's going to like call me. <laughs> yeah. like, Are you watching the end of this tournament? This is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> they they have a very restrictive media deal, um, and I think that they hopefully in the in the near future will try to get out of that. But we, I actually talked. I talked with this about Trent a little bit. You know, they're trying. She was the, Molly. Molly is the, the name of the commissioner. Samen or Samen. I don't know her last. I don't know how to pronounce her last name. She was saying that they're they're starting to track not just viewership. And, you know, because I, I brought up like, oh, you know, viewers are down on the PGA Tour. You know, is that something? And she said, yeah, you know, well, viewership. And you're going to like this, Frankie. Viewership might be down on, on linear television, but our social impressions are up, you know, 127 percent. And we're rolling out or whatever it was. And we're rolling out a new digital strategy where we've hired, you know, consultants to. How do we monetize this more social media following that we have? How do we, you know, reach more people w- outside the confines of this media deal? Because the problem with these big media deals, and the PJ Tour has one too, that goes through twenty twenty nine, is the media ecosystem changes so fast. And if you're locked into the same format of a broadcast and the same windows for fucking ten years, you're going to be a dinosaur by the end. Right. I mean, that might be the result of a, a, a league that's just not getting good views and they're like, trying to find a way it's to chicken like, or no, actually egg. everything yeah. else is. Yeah, because yeah. like you can look at like a Mr. Beast that's been on YouTube for like 15 years and he's still getting 133 million views an episode. And it's like, well, like media's changed. TikTok is here. And it's, it's like he's just still doing the same thing and just crushing because people want to watch him. Um, yeah, I, I do agree with that where I you have to be able to 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 move. But, you know, there's leagues out there that you know they they adapt you know i feel like the nfl ratings um, are up the nfl like people watch that on tv yeah, that's what i was gonna say it's like you don't want to shit on the open but it's like people just watch the nfl regardless of what's going on but in the I, world i mean the nfl might be a, un- a unicorn in its own right like i think nba ratings are down i think i'm sure baseball ratings aren't great like yeah i i get what you're yeah. saying it's it's probably a little bit of both like they're probably like it's not as popular of a league, but it's also like that's kind of the way things are going too. So it kind of hurts both ways. Yeah, yeah, and I would I would put it on on the league on the LBJ. I'm like, here you have a star who's American. 
She's got great family with like athletic roots. She can crush it at the Met Gala. She's won five events in a row, which is the first time that's happened in like 15 or 20 years. She's won the most recent major. Like she's got a sister out there. If they can't package that from a from a media standpoint into being incredibly yeah. helpful to, to the LPGA Tour, that's on the LPGA. And it's like that they just got to be able to figure out you have to have people that are making salaries, that are earning money, who their job is in marketing, and PR, whatever it is, to like do a good job with that. You've been handed the best thing you could possibly have. If you're not doing a great job with it, that's on you. I would look at like Ricky Fowler as, the, as an example. Ricky Fowler is not like an electric interview. Ricky Fowler shows absolutely no emotion really on the course. It's not like he's this unbelievable electric guy. yet the marketability of the team around him have turned him into one of the top five stars in the world of golf. Despite the fact that we make fun of, he doesn't win that often. He's never won a major. He's like one of the biggest names in the world. Everybody's wearing his hat. All the kids are big Ricky Fowler fans. So it's like, there's a way to do it. And they've been handed something that is a unicorn. It's a five to a player that they need to just be able to do a great job with. And if they drop the ball, that's on them. I'd also say that the, um, like golf doesn't like golf doesn't have the clippable viral stuff where, with Caitlin Clark, she shoots from the logo and it goes crazy. Like golf just doesn't have that men or women. Not I don't really. understand. Yeah. I, Caitlin Clark's an impossible person to compare. Cause yeah, she's selling more. I think I, this could have been a fake stat, but did she sell more jerseys of her Indiana fever Jersey than like the Dallas Cowboys did last year? Did you see that one? I saw that, but I'm just in a zone where I believe any Caitlin Clark stat that I hear. I mean, the Dallas Cowboys, know, just, I think are globally known as like the most, um lucrative and famous logo in all sports like that star like travels like them the and entire, the yankees yeah travels the whole world like how in yeah. the world did the indiana fever like basketball jersey how many people are wearing that thing around she's amazing and i i love watching her it. but that's fucking nuts i know but like a basketball jersey doesn't travel as much as like i don't know that was that's because no, the arms stat. are out people are less likely to wear a basketball jersey because the arms are out Right. Or, or yeah, that's just like a football jersey is just like way more acceptable to wear around. Uh, like you had just like a, 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 a 45 year old male just walking in with just bare arms to like a bar. Like a right. I mean, even picture me like if I walked in out. somewhere we were and I'm wearing a Kevin Durant jersey, nothing <laughs> on crazy. under it. It's like, what, what is the boardy barn? Um, <laughs> fucking. But so like when Caitlin Clark was playing and she was on that run and like Iowa was playing Nebraska or something, right? Like, weren't they able to just like throw her game on ESPN, even though like it probably wasn't originally aired for that before, like, you know, these TV deals are done years in advance yeah. or whatever. Like the Caitlin Clark phenomenon didn't just like, it, it literally just like popped out of nowhere to them. Right. It wasn't like in their 10 year plan of like big 10 getting ESPN coverage in women's basketball or whatever. And all of a sudden she goes on this run and it feels like no matter where you looked, she was everywhere on ESPN, whatever. Like that's, I think Riggs' point where it's like, you need people that know what the fuck they're doing. Yeah. Not saying that they don't know what they're doing. There's probably very good workers at the LPG tour, but like, it should be everywhere, man. It should be on Scott Van Pelt. La best thing he saw tonight. It should, she should be getting interviewed every single time you turn it on a sports channel. Cause she's dominating the game of golf right now. This is a run that will never, that might not ever, you might never not ever see it again. So how is she not on like NBC sports on like her Sunday round going for the sixth win or the fifth win? Like where, where is that? Where is that disconnection? Like, are they not putting the money behind it? Are they not investing in it? Here's what are they I'll not say. taking these like risks? The 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 major that she won in she won the major in Houston. The ratings were okay. They weren't. They that's weren't. That's also a shit. I'm sorry. That's a shit major. Like they don't. It's kind of forced. It's the shit. Right. It's like the show. It's it's in Houston. It's like not that exciting. Whereas the others, like the U.S. Women's Open, has like the history. It's the biggest thing. Yeah. The Women's U.S. British Open has like. We get that. It's British. This one, I feel like, doesn't have much of a soul. They took it from where they jumped into, like, Poppy's Pond to this place in Houston that's, like, all right. So I do think, like, she wins the women's U.S. Open and she's still on this kind of run. I think it'll get a lot more love and juice. Um, but we'll kind of see. I I got to run. I'm going to miss closest to the pin, which stinks. But I love Nellie Corda. I think she's Damn. awesome. I think she looked amazing. She did. That's a fact. I think she looked great. I'm going to miss my flight, so I have to run to the airport. All right. Yeah. All right. We'll all right. see you in a we're just going to gain tomorrow. points on you. Goodbye. You yeah. have, wait, what? We're going to gain points, points on you. you. Simple as I know. I'm going to, I'm going to mute. I'm going to mute the conversation. I'm not going to be able to deal. And I'm going to get, I'm going to get FOMO and the whole deal. So yeah. good luck. Okay. I hope you guys, I hope you guys all tie every time. Bye. The closest to the pin segment is brought to you by fireball cinnamon whiskey. Fire uh, is the best. Fireball is the best. It goes down so smooth as you can see in our newest video with 
Bob Does Sports. We did a nice little fireball challenge. When you find yourself obsessing over golf like we do, Fireball Whiskey is always there to help. You hit a bad shot. You take one of those 50 milliliter shooters. You're feeling pretty good out there, Trent. You're feeling real good. You're feeling really good. Like you said, you do something good on the golf course. You do something bad out there. Celebrate it or drink one. You're going to feel better. Fireball whiskey. It's the best. If you really feel like upping the game and upping the ante on the golf course this weekend, make sure to grab the new Fireball Birdie Shot Club. It's literally a golf club filled with Fireball nips. You got to go see it. It's an amazing little uh, you know, contraption, um, and you're just going to really enjoy those Fireballs. So let's get right into Closest to the Pin. And Alex Bush, we have for the uh, Closest to the Pin. I want you to read off the results from the Riggsy and Frankie show from last week. Huge opportunity for us to gain points on the leaders and on the field. Um, so, Alex, the floor is yours. There's some bang. There's some hammering going on in my house behind me that I'm hearing. I don't know what's going on, but they got to stop the hammering. I don't know. Are you getting I, some renovations almost, done or what? No, almost to the point where I have to see what that is because like, it's just me and her in here. And if that hammering is actually happening, it might be a nightmare. All right, Alex, let's hear the rankings. All right, so last week we gained a few points here. First, first question was shots on goal for Hurricanes in Game One versus the Rangers. They finished with twenty five. So Riggs or Frankie and I both won that at thirty three. Second was Chris Goddard's round one score at CJ Cup. Byron Nelson he shot a sixty seven. Frankie won that with a sixty nine. Not a boy, Chris. Wow. Not a boy, Chrissy. He shot sixty seven. Yeah, sixty seven in round one. Woo. And then points for Joel and Bean in game six versus the Knicks, 39. Riggs was the highest with 36, so he took that. And then the last one I just checked was the Rotten Tomatoes user score for Fall Guy. Uh, as of today. Week. Yeah, like as, it, as, as, it, as of this morning was 87%. What? And, yep. And the, the uh, critic score was 82, I believe. Oh, really I high. gotta see it. I gotta see. Yeah, the movie. that movie's ripping. But it that flopped. Movie is... It flopped. It did like twenty. Oh, did it? Mi- it did like twenty million opening weekend. And the budget was one hundred and forty. Oh, I've just seen good reviews. That's all I saw. So I saw a lot of people. I know. I saw Rear Ads was like this sucks because he or someone. No, you know what it was? It was Frank the Tank that just wrote whoops because it said the budget was one hundred and twenty million and it made twenty five million opening weekend. He just wrote whoops. And uh, and then all the replies were like, "That's what sucks about the movies right now is that everyone wants to go see like a uh, adaptation of an old movie or like a true story brought to life, or um, you know, The Lion King in real, uh, you know, in the real time Lion King, or whatever live action. No one wants to see real time. No one wants to see like an actual movie from someone's brain that's just <laughs> this, unique. This you know, line actually screenplay. singing right now, real time, <laughs> yeah, right now, right now." <laughs> They set these cameras up and we're watching it happen. David it's Attenborough unbelievable. is just like, yeah, he's just, we're going to bring you, we're going to bring you to the bush. Yeah. All right. So keep going, Bush. So, so that was the last one. I won that at 84%. Fuck you. Um, so Frankie and I both picked up two points. So the I'm, leaderboard now, Trent I'm Ryan, 25, three. Riggs, 22, Dan, 19. Frankie 18, Alex 11. Right. Have you been updating right. the like longer term ones where we finally got an answer like with yes. like Myrtle Beach yeah, and stuff? Yeah, like the okay. Q and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yep. cool. All right, I've got the close to the pin questions this week. We'll start off with an NBA one. How many points will Jalen Brunson have in game three and four combined against the Pacers? For a little bit of context, uh, Jalen Brunson has been averaging 36.6 points per game in the 2024 playoffs. And in game one against the Pacers, he scored 43 points. He's the guy. So this right guy's now. hot. Hold on now. I got to pull up my text messages. They're going back to Indiana, right? Right. So there's a game two is tonight when we're recording. So we're not going to count that one. We're talking games three and four, which are later in the week. That offensive foul was really something. Speaking of the NBA, I played golf with Pau Gasol yesterday. What? Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Big guy. What's he like? Dude, he's a, he's a beauty. He's an awesome guy and he's such a he's like he's been playing golf for three years and he has such good like form and tempo. He's going to be really good. And on the 18th hole, we were all tied and we were playing this hammer game and he hammered and he had he had a stroke and it's like a 450 yard par four and he hit it like 275 down the middle and then hit like a six iron to eight feet and was like, this is winning time. It was sick. He's so tall. Yeah, he's like really full tall. seven feet. He said his he said his parents are six three and six one, and they and she just birthed two seven footers. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. 
Anyways, all right, everybody in? All right, everyone's in. We've got Danny Rapstar, 66, Frankie Borelli, 61, Trent Ryan, 71, Alex, 69. Uh, second one, a little, bit of, a little bit of topical pop culture here. Kendrick Lamar's Drake Diss, Not Like Us, currently has 25,372,934 views on YouTube. How many views will it have by Monday at midnight? So Sunday night going into Monday. How many views will the Kendrick Lamar diss, not like us, that currently has over 25 million views? So we're talking total. We're not saying how many more, just total views by Monday. Is there enough to like make a book out of all these disses? Like how many have they how many have they gone back and like at least three each, right? Or more? I think Kendrick has more. Drake has two or three, and then Kendrick has like four. I hate when Kendrick Lamar does that voice. Which one? Where it's like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. like it's like all oh, like high. It's like oh, it's impossible <laughs> to listen to. I I sit there acting like I know what I'm listening to. Like I don't know what the I, fuck they're talking about. I tweeted that like a couple diss tracks ago. Where uh, ten years ago I would have been all in on this, and I've gotten more into it the last couple of days. Ten years ago I would have been like going through basically annotating rap songs, like just like what are they talking about? What's the deal? Now I'm just like. Cool. That yeah. sounds cool. <laughs> sounds nice awesome. sounds. Nice yeah. sounds. Sounds really good. All right. I think we're all in here. Yep. We're all in. We've got Frankie Borelli, 38 million. Oh. Oh, you guys want specific. Okay. Trent Ryan, 37,654,765. Oh, I, I, yeah. I, I'm, all right, also, I'm you didn't use Invisible Ink. Crazy. Dan, 33,666,666. Six, 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 six. <laughs> and then I just put 36 value. Wow, we all were kind of in the same ballpark, though. All right. Yeah, we know how YouTube trends work. We know we know the arc. True. If there's a bunch of guys who like know the arc, it's it's these guys sitting right here. Okay. Uh, third close to the pin question. Alistair Doherty playing in uh, the Myrtle Beach Ooh. Classic this week. Ooh. This is going to be a little touchy, but it's, it is what Ooh. it is. I figure he's in the event. We might as well put him on the graphics so people know. Um, how many birdies will he have on Friday at the Myrtle Beach Classic? I know nothing about um, how he's been playing or, or anything like that, but how many birdies will, will he have on Friday at the Myrtle Beach Classic? Alistair makes a lot of birdies. That's not the issue. I'm starving. What are you going to eat? I don't know, man. You know what I haven't had in a long time? A good old-fashioned Long Island bacon, egg, and cheese on a roll. Do it. That sounds great. Extra that sounds egg, awesome. Extra egg over medium, where it's a little runny. Nice crispy mm. bacon right inside a nice poppy seed roll. I missed that. I tried to get one of those as a bagel place down the street, and I didn't realize until I left that it was fucking gluten-free bagels. Ah. It's a classic L.A. situation. That's a classic L.A. All right. We are all in Frankie four. Trent, four. Dan, five. Alex, five. Yeah, that's about right. All right. And this last one is very random because I was having trouble thinking of a fourth and I did no research on it. I went online. I did a random location generator and I and it came up with Svodkin, Slovakia. And I said, okay. what will be the high temperature in oh, Svodkin, Slovakia on Sunday, May 12th? <laughs> I have no idea what the temperature is there. I don't even know what wow. the climate's like. So what will the high be in Svaden, Slovakia on Sunday? Is this in Fahrenheit? Just regular. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Fahrenheit, I guess. Okay. Regular, whatever whatever my phone is set to. Svaden, Slovakia? I have Sunday, no sorry. idea how to even think if it's in the... Is it like wintertime there? Is it? See, this is why I picked it. I like these ones where there's... I think there's almost got to be every once in a while just one where there's no research and nobody has any idea. And I think this is a good one. All right, we're all in. Dan Rappaport, 71. Wow. Frankie, 61. Trent, 58. Alex, 69. Wow. All right. I just feel like this is the time of year where it's nice everywhere. Yeah. Where it's warm everywhere. Yeah, it does feel that way. It's just like way, pretty but... warm everywhere. Like, it's, that's, that's definitely in the Northern Hemisphere, so it's definitely, you know, same seasons as us, and it just feels like a reasonable temperature. All right. Those are the, that's close to the pin for this week. We'll see. I'm doing, um, I'm going to do that, uh, what do I shoot from the Red Tees video tomorrow? Oh, nice. I'm very excited about it because I'm playing some good golf. And I think that um, I'll have a lot of data to show how I play Colonial from like the back tees. And it's like, how much of a difference is it from the forward tees? I think it's going to be pretty significant. When I go hole by hole, like there's so many par fives when they're reaching two that I'm going to be putting for eagle. And if I can hit those irons good or hit them well, and if I can drive the ball well on par fours and I have like little wedge shots in, 
I think I'm going to make a lot of birdies. If I don't, I'll be pretty fucking pissed. Well, I said even par, and I got laughed at you by got, Joel David, yeah, yeah. so I'm rooting for you big time. Yeah. If you drive it well, like you, you've been driving it well, if you drive it well, you're going to have m- mid to short irons into the par fives. I was thinking, like, if I'm just ripping driver at all these par fours, I'm going to find myself in, like, greenside bunkers and shit. So it does, it's just a way different game. You just got to, you just, so when you hit it in, like, because, yeah, you're going to have a lot of drivable par fours. When you hit it in, like, weird spots, just make, just make sure you make par. Right. You know right. Don't I mean? try and go for don't the hero try birdie. And, don't try and go for the hero shot. Like, if you, they need to play it to 30 feet. Like, play it to 30 feet and two putt, and you're going to make birdies. Right. That's a great point. Yeah. That's, I mean, if that's I come what, like, in Scott at Boss, that's... par, if I come in at even par, that's an un. That would be the first time I've ever done that, and that would be an unbelievable well, success in this in this experiment. Well, what is the tees are probably your handicaps? What now, like a four or something? I actually got down right now. I'm like a three nine. Okay, Most so ever. I think those tees those tees are probably rated like sixty six. Right. So like seventy two is like I think I stand by my I stand by my prediction. Yeah. I mean, when I play Colonial now from the Blues, which is the one up from the back, like I'm averaging on nine, like a 38, 39, like almost every single time, like a bad day. It's a 40. And because this is our home course, like I know it now. I know the greens. They're fucking pure. Like I can't wait. I cannot wait. I got to hope that the weather holds off. Hopefully it doesn't rain. But um, if all goes well, that will be done. All right. We've got from the gallery presented by TaylorMade. From the gallery is brought to you by TaylorMade. Experience your drivers in 10K with the all new QI 10 Max driver from our friends at TaylorMade. The QI 10 Max is the most forgiving driver TaylorMade has ever made with 10K MOI, the moment of inertia, for maximum stability and forgiveness at impact. More forgiveness means more long and straight drives, even on off center strikes. That last sentence right there is the thing that sticks out to me. I struggle with hitting it on the center of the club face every single time. I'm quick. I'm handsy. I don't get it in the right slot. I'm not Scotty Scheffler. I'm not able to perfectly bring the club into the same spot every single time. So when I do hit it off the toe or I do hit it off the heel, I've noticed that with the QI-10, I have the core driver. You have the max, Trent. Um, yep. it, it just absolutely, just without a doubt, factually helps me keep that ball straighter. I've noticed that my misses, when they used to be in the trees or they used to be out of bounds left, they are now just in the rough. They're in the rough on the right. They're in the rough on the left because I know I, I miss hit it, but it's just it's not going where it used to go. And that is a huge savior in me scoring lower on the golf course. It really is. The days of missing these fairways, too, when you do hit it right, they're numbered. You're going to start hitting a lot of fairways with the QI-10. I'm telling you right now where it's taking over the world. Danny Rat talks about it a little bit. Everyone's using the QI-10. Shop the QI-10 Max and the QI-10 and the QI-10 LS drivers. Plus, schedule a custom fitting at TaylorMadeGolf.com. Anybody got any hot debated questions that they've been talking with their friends about in the golf world? Do you think that at this point, Fat Perez is a more commonly known golfer than Pat Perez? I think that's correct. Yes. Yeah, I think I think it is. It's I, certainly I wonder if, way closer than people would think. I wonder if people, oh, there's a lot, probably a lot of people who don't even know that it's like a pun on Pat Perez. They're just like, oh, yeah, this guy's last name must be Perez. 100.2. When we yeah. did that first video with Pat Perez, with Fat Perez, it was actually pretty, um, um, you know, recent to when we did the video with Pat Perez, I feel like it wasn't, there wasn't that much time in between. Maybe it was a year, yeah. maybe it was a little bit less. Um, so he was at the back of our, our brains. Like you saw this guy, he kind of, he, he swings it really, really well. He's big and he like kind of looks like Pat Perez and I, you got the joke immediately, but now that years have gone by since that moment, I mean, at that, when we did that video with Pat Perez, he, he had a, um, private instagram account he had like 125 followers he was not a public persona he was just right he had just joined bob to sports he didn't even join him full time he was still working at his job in virginia whatever he was doing and like you never would have thought that that name was going to be its own household name because you just thought it was just playing on the guy that was clearly on the pga tour that was sick that we just did a video with on foreplay and now you go a couple of years later and it's like you forget that Pat Perez is the guy and Fat Perez was always just, it's almost like Pat Perez made his name after Fat Perez. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's how much it's I mean, yeah. Pat Perez just feels like he, he hasn't been in the spotlight for anything. No, he got divorced and then went to live. live It's just like, it's different Pat Perez. I saw him at the, I saw him at the live Miami event and I was like, uh, he comes over and he's like, what the fuck is up? You know, like classic. And I, and I said, you know, we were talking about coming together and, you know, guys wanting to play, you know, everyone on the same tour. He goes, I don't fucking want to go back. No way. Walks away. <laughs> it was great. He, 
I will say, so we when we were on a run of four man scrambles where we were playing against Kisner and Perez and and home and, and all these people, like he is still to this day the guy who impressed me the most. He he sh- he played so well and made it look so easy. Didn't tee up a single ball, would just throw the ball down on the tee box and just rip a driver or rip a three wood. He made it look so easy. And it's one of the best videos we've ever done. It came down to 18. Um, he lipped out a putt. Spoiler alert for people who haven't watched it, but this was years ago. He was so impressive. He just has like, he's skilled as fuck, but I could see how he's like, I got my money now. I don't care about anything anymore. Yeah, I think he's, I think once, remember he, remember he, he had the quote. He was like, yeah, that 10 million hit, it was fucking unbelievable. <laughs> That's just who he is. He's like, yeah. uh, if you, show me the money, and I'll I'll do whatever. Which you know you gotta yeah, respect I, it. He's very authentic. I, I appreciate is. his voice for sure. Five days ago on the golf Reddit, someone said my partner went albatross eagle back to back today. Do you think that's ever happened before in the game of golf? Five under through two holes. Been a lot of golf rounds out there, so probably. But that is a hell of I've never. I mean, albatross is more more uh, rare than a hole in one. Dude, sure. This might be the first time that's ever happened. No, yeah, no. Oh, dude, no. Bro, we're talking about a game holding out, fives. holding out in two on a par five, and then just draining the next one. I mean, that's like this saying five hundred years old. All right, like how, would back to back hole in ones would be impossible, right? Just because of the course setup, and now you have. You're basically hitting two hole in ones from 200 and plus back to back, 200 yard plus back to back. I don't I'm not trying to take away from its legitimacy and incredibleness, but I do think you run the simulation enough times you're going to get like that's it has to have happened before. I Googled it. <clears throat> the first I said Albatross Eagle back to back. The first response is the very Reddit page, Reddit post that you're talking oh, I'm about. I'm seeing it. I'm seeing the sec- it. This, the second one is. We had Xander Shoffley on the show, and he said he went albatross birdie eagle back to back to back. Jeez, but you're right. There, was a, the there no, was a birdie in between. Karen Stupples did it in the Women's Open. Karen Stupples, is a, she's still on golf Twitter. She's like an announcer. That's cool. That's awesome. She, she did, did it, it in a tournament. She did it in a tournament. All right. That's sick. Still <laughs> awesome. Top comment was, happy Gilmore accomplished that feat no more than an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I bet golf Reddit is just dripping with your classic oh, yeah. golf movie quotes. Oh, yeah. We've we've asked about this because um, there there was a whole thread here that says like what do you like better the six thirty a.m. round or like the four p.m. round? We did that. We've recently. talked about yeah. this. Yeah, we did that recently. Yeah, and we all said we the split. later one, right? I said early morning. I said I, I'm I've got a soft spot for dew sweeping in the morning. The the court the greens are fresh. The wind is calm. You got the whole day. Uh, you know after again uh, after we did behind the greens it really shined a light on like when you play that 6 30 a.m tea time the fact that that place is ab- as pure as you've ever seen a golf course the fact that there are guys out there that are working to get that place that pure for a 6 30 a.m tea time is actually insane it's out of control they're working in We're the lucky. dark they're fucking they're raking bunkers they're cutting grass they're putting in the holes they're moving the pins this is all happening crack ass of dawn before the crack ass of dawn it's like four in the morning they Once start more beat the sunrise the whole world sleeping um should we wrap it up i think we got to wrap that up because we got two interviews today we've got a big video coming out tonight obviously breaking 90s coming out let's just get right into all that i want to hear these interviews i want to get i want to get some good um insight from pga tour players you don't have to hear my fucking voice anymore i'm ready to rock all right sounds good hit it hard boys hit it hard hit it hard Do you ever feel like money is just flying out of your account and you have no idea where it's going? Like, what the heck? Where's all this money going? How do I have all these all subscriptions? The like, where's all this money that I'm accumulating? Where is it all going? Between streaming services, fitness apps, delivery services, parenting apps, it's endless. It's nonstop. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills. It's a lifesaver. It really is. You go on this app, you go on Rocket Money, and it itemizes everything that you're spending, what you shouldn't be spending it on, how much you're spending it in stupid areas, and it helps you um, understand where all of this money is going. And it's a, it's a huge tool to be able to cancel because I don't want to be a cancel guy. I don't want to have to like go into all of these apps and cancel my subscriptions and be on the phone. Imagine calling someone no, and canceling a subscription. Never. Ugh. I will, I'll never do that again. 
and it's thanks to Rocket Money because you go on there, see a subscription that you don't want, that you didn't know you had, or you're doubled up. I know we've all done that. You hit a button, they take care of it for you. I'm not calling anybody. I'll never, I'll never be, on, I'll never hear waiting phone music ever again. Oh, thanks to Rocket Money, you'll never have to get on the phone with customer service ever again. They'll even get you a refund for the last couple of months of wasted money and negotiate to lower your bills for you for up to twenty. All you have to do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of all the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save the members an average of $720 a year with over 6 500 sorry, five, they'll get there. 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com/4 F O R E that's rocketmoney.com/4 rocketmoney.com slash four all right we are pleased to welcome on do i call you do i call you ben can i call you ben yeah. why why is it young hun on the you never changed it like tom no, King, I never changed it, tom. Yeah. why did you never change it uh it's still fish more official you know sport cards and stuff so I, w- I like to have it as my full name but when people call me ben's a lot easier so yeah Ben is a lot easier for sure yeah. than being on. So we are we are joined by Ben on. I believe it's your first time on the show. Is that correct? Yeah, it is correct. And uh, we were just looking at this that you're you're eighth in the FedEx right now, which is pretty unbelievable. If I re- I read the names of the guys ahead of you, <clears throat> Scotty Scheffler, Wyndham Clark, Xander Shoffley, Salat Gala, Ludwig Oberg, Hideki Matsuyama, Chris Kirk, and then Ben on. You are having um, the best, at least the best start of your career this year. Uh, what's been different? What's what's clicked? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I've been playing better golf um, starting last year. Um, feel like I had some good weeks last year, but not as as a, as more consistent as I'd like. But uh, this year, it's been a lot more consistent. I think um, had some top finishes here and there. Um, uh, just uh, generally, my game feels pretty good this year. I think um, a little better than last year, better than it has been for me. So let's see how long this goes. But um, I I believe I I have the game this year. You definitely have the game this year. I want to I want to go back to the beginning. Anytime a guy is on the show for the first time, we like to get kind of the full story. So I was doing a little research. You got some famous parents, or at least athletic parents. Uh, what was it like growing up? So both both your parents medaled in table tennis in the yep. Olympics. So tell me about growing up as the as the son of two table tennis greats. It was it was okay because golf was in the Olympics when I was growing up. So you know I would have never I thought I'll never have a chance to play Olympics because golf was in it, but you know, all of a sudden, the golf was in it starting in 2016. I'm like, oh, uh, now I need to get a medal. No, they never won gold medal yet, so hopefully I can uh, one year. <laughs> uh, but uh, we it's, it's, uh, we played different sports. My parents played different sports, but they, they're they very successful of what they did. And I think I got I got a lot of benefits from it. You know, not just the, uh, obviously not the table tennis, but, you know, the mental side of it. So... I don't think I feel any. I felt any pressure when I was growing up because we played different sports. Um, I, I definitely got a lot of helps from them. Did you? Did, how's your table tennis game? Are you, you know, I know it's like a big thing on tour. Are you like, do you whip all these guys? Not really. I mean, I'm not the best table tennis player on tour, but I'm okay. Like, I'll probably, if I put in the golf handicap, I probably ten or twelve, maybe. So you're I mean, average. I'm very average. I, I would say I'm that good, but. I never, I really play. I mean, even my, my parents come around, like we play once a year, maybe. And when I was growing up the same way, I probably would play once or twice a year. I didn't play that much, but when I play, I feel like I can be a decent player. <laughs> do your parents play table tennis against each other? Like, you know, I would think if you've got two, I, I would do that. If my wife was, a, if we were both Olympic table tennis players, I'd be playing all the time. Yeah, but I never see them play at home. Like, they will never, they never play against each other, but they play like, in a competition when they're playing, you know, back then, but after we, they retired, they never played against each other. My dad coaches a little bit of table tennis, but my mom doesn't do any of that. So I never seen him play like com- like competitively off, off the off the table court. So yeah, so I read a story <clears throat> that you started golf in a very um, interesting way. Most people start with the driver or with the putter. Yeah, tell me about how you learned golf. When I was like six, I think five or six, you know, my dad took me to the driver range in Korea and uh, he had the golf clubs, you know, it was never fit or anything. He just got the gift from people, right? And somehow he got a gift like 
like one or two iron, I think, in this bag, right? And then it was a steel shop. One, I think it was a one iron. It was blade. And I just liked it as of a six, six year old. So I just pulled that club out. I always, I didn't have any other clubs than a one iron, I think. The one iron was my one favorite. One iron with a steel shaft blade when you're learning how to play golf. I guess that's going to teach you how to find the center of the face. I guess. I mean, that's the first club I picked up that he had. He, I asked him, why would you have a one iron in the bag? I mean, he's not the best golfer in the world. I mean, he's probably 16, 17 handicap, but somehow he had a one iron in the bag. So I, I, I use it. I, I don't think I use anything else. You know, it's just like, you know, playing around. And I wasn't trying to be a professional, obviously. But that's the one iron is the first club I picked up, I think. So you obviously got pretty good because you moved to the U.S. Uh, as a teenager to go to like a golf academy. Um, at that point, you you know, you were leaving your home country. I, I don't think you spoke any English. To, what was that transition like? You're, you're basic. I mean, you're not a pro, but you're when you're moving across an ocean to play golf at an academy, you're kind of a pro. Yeah, I, I mean, it wasn't easy, but I, I, well, my family and I thought it was better um, to come over here. And if I want to be a pro golfer, I think, I think this is the place. Um, had a much better practice facility, uh, you know, more playing tournaments and going to school at the same time. In Korea, it was very hard to do both of them. You know, my parents want me to stay in the school a little bit. Um and in Korea, it's almost impossible because school finishes a little too late. But I found this golf academy in Brainton. You know, that's how I started. You know, trying to dream of being a professional golfer. Uh, it had all the resources that I needed. You know, a lot of good practice facilities, and then to go to school at the same time. Um, that's why we moved. It wasn't it wasn't easy, but you know, I was young. I was fourteen, fifteen. You know, um, coming to a different country, not speaking any language. It was. It was hard at first, but I got used to it pretty quickly. I had a lot of good friends around me. Um, so I never really felt any struggles, I call it. You know, it, was, it was fun. You know, I was young. I had fun playing golf and then meeting his friends. So, um, How did you learn English? Because I remember, I think it was Rom was saying he like listened to rap music. Everyone's got a story. How did you learn English? I just didn't have many Korean-speaking friends around. That, that kind of so forced no me to... Yeah, I had no yeah. choice, and kind of, I, I liked it, I guess. It forced me to speak English only, and and I learned kind of quickly, I think, within a half an year, a year, you know, that was that was a big help, I think, not having not having too many Koreans around me. You win the U.S. Amateur in 2009. You're the youngest player ever to win the U.S. Amateur. You set that record in 2009. Did you feel like that was coming? Was it a surprise? Because that's, I mean, you were quite literally the youngest to ever do it. Yeah, I, that, that was definitely a surprise because I wasn't the best junior golfer. I was probably top 15 golfer, junior golfer maybe, but I wasn't the best. There are so many good players in front of me. Um, like Jordan was number one back then when I was young. Um, Justin Thomas and those guys are pretty good, but I was never the best junior golfer. And I was a, I was going into my senior year. You know, I qualified for the U.S. Amateur the year before I won. Um, I lost in the playoff and could go to match play. And I didn't bring enough clothes. I've, I've told this many times, but you know, I didn't bring enough shirts. I only brought like six or five shirts, you know, not knowing I was going to make the finals. So I had to buy a shirt from Pro Shop and, and ended up winning the US Amateur. So that was definitely not expected, not at all. But uh, yeah, it just happened. Well, you missed you miss the NIL era. You know what I mean? Yeah, if I you mean, were, <laughs> you would have signed some deals. You would have had some sponsors on those shirts these days. Yeah, I see a lot of kids that have that, you know, the deals, and it's good for them. You know, the, the it changes, right? I mean, that was what was it? I won it when I was seventeen, so that was almost twenty years ago. So, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that would have been nice, but uh, it is what it is. Right? And you, and you, the next, the next year, you got to the semis. You lost. You were up. Yeah. Does that? I think you were up in the semifinal yep. match. You had a good chance to repeat. I was and three up, I think, to nine to go, and I lost, I believe. So, yeah. Did you? Did you blow it, or did he? Did he play good? Oh, I blew it. I think. I definitely blew. He played well too, but I blew at the same time. You know, it's it's match play. Anything can happen. I was playing pretty well. Uh, I got ahead of myself, and and David was playing really well. And you know, it's it's very unfortunate that it kind of hurts, but it is what it is. So most people, when they win the U.S. Amateur, they turn pro. You know, <clears throat> if not right away, then after the the next yeah. major season. You know, they have all this momentum. You have the name recognition. You decided to go to to Berkeley, to Cal. Um, you only stayed one year. So what went behind the decision to go instead of turn pro? And then why did you decide to leave after one year? I mean, I was so young, I think. Like I said, I won when I was just before I, was, I turned 18. And 
when I won, I was still 17 and I didn't think I was ready. Like I said, it was very, it was a surprise um, when I won and I got to play many PGA Tour events after I won, um, mm -hmm. play a few majors and my game was not nearly as ready and I would miss a lot of cuts. I made one cut, I think. Um, so my game wasn't ready. So, you know, I wanted to go to college, at least see what it feels like. Um, and I did, and, and it was a lot harder than I thought to keep both skill and study and, and, and play golf. Well, state. you went to, you didn't, you know, you didn't go to no disrespect to these schools, but you didn't go to Arizona state or you didn't go to Oklahoma state. You went yeah. to a very academic school. So for my brain capability, it wasn't, it was too much. So, um, my golf, you know, I didn't, it wasn't improving as much as I liked, uh, but I really love, you know, the tournaments to be played, uh, having the team around and using the facility was great, but I just, I just couldn't keep up with everything altogether. So and then I decided to turn pro and see what it's like. And then, you know, obviously I struggled for the first couple of years, um, but I had a summer to play, so it was nice. I wanted to ask you about the challenge tour. Um, you know, you, 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 tried unsuccessfully to get your PJ tour card right away. You go yep. over to Europe, you know, it's, it's gotten a lot of press. Brooks Kepka did the same thing. You guys play in some wild places. Yeah. What was, what was the craziest place that you went and what are some of the, what are some of the memories that stick out? Because that's a, that's a yeah. crazy life experience. It is. It is. We go to decent cities, but you know, we go to places like India, Kazakhstan, uh, Ukraine, you know, all these wild places to Kenya. Um, it was good. You know, I was still young, right? Um, I loved it. You know, I traveled with my dad. My dad was caddying for me in the first three years in Challenge Tour. Um, yeah, it was rough. You know, the prize money is not much, obviously. You know, we were traveling and staying in small hotels, rented cars, um, some of the wild places, like you said. But I, I, it all turned great, I think, playing different golf courses and different cultures, different, you know, everything was so different than U.S. So, um I think it was a great experience, I think. I, I loved it. You've seen the world. You've seen, I've seen the world. I've seen you... everything. I mean, there are not many places I haven't been in the world, you know, especially in Europe. Um, I've seen most of the countries. I'm going to I'm gonna ask you some countries, and you're going to tell me if you've played a golf tournament there, okay? Sure. Yeah. United States. Yeah. Obviously. obviously. Canada. Yep. Mexico. Yep. Uh, Argentina. No. No. Okay. No. Australia. Yep. Korea. Yep. Japan. Yep. India. Yep. Russia? Oh, Russia, no. They had a European tour event, but I didn't play. No. Okay, but you played in Ukraine. Yep. Morocco? Yep. Uh, Kenya? Yep. South Africa? Yep. And then, I mean, obviously, you've played all three. I mean, you've played in England, Scotland, yeah, England, Ireland. England, Belgium, Austria, Denmark, Norway, Finland, you know, <laughs> Sweden, everywhere. Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan, I played a Mauritius island. I don't know if you heard about it. It's just a I know Mauritius. I mean, I've, yeah, seen, yeah. I've just seen the European tour event there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I played a pro M there. Um, yeah, Azerbaijan, um, all over. I say I played many, Turkey? many. Yeah, Turkey. Yeah, yeah. You you might you think there's anybody on tour who's played more in more countries than you have? I don't think so. I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. Yeah, your 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 frequent fly flyer miles must be fucking off the charts. Yeah, I, I, you know what? I think my dad kept him all. <laughs> I don't remember having him up. Dad took all the miles. Dad's yeah, up there in first class, fucking popping champagne. And yeah, you're like, you know. he's using all the miles. He's like, ah, oh, you don't need it anymore. You just pay for it. I was like, sure, I'll pay for it. <laughs> um, so some of the other Korean guys, I know you're in a bit, a bit of a different situation because you've lived in the U.S. for a long time. The military service, was that not something that you had to worry about? Um, I moved in a very young age. Um, when I was 14, so I, I still have a Korean passport, but um, last time I went back to Korea was like three, four years ago, so I don't really go back much. My parents come over like every half an year, you know, a few times a year, so I don't, they don't consider me as a resident, so they're like, you know, you, you don't literally live here, but so you don't have to, technically, you don't have to do it. That's nice. Yeah, it is nice. Um, I got really lucky. Uh, but some other guys, they they go back to Korea more than I do. Um, as a, I mean, I'm just following the laws. It says you know I don't have to do it unless you say I think Korea for long periods of time or something like that. But I mean, I try to say long. I mean, I don't really have a reason to go back at that at that much cause, because yeah. of my parents move. I mean, come over here a lot. So um, same as my in laws. So you know, as of now, I just. 
don't have to really I, I technically don't have to do it ish you know yeah well, but if i get yeah. a medal then i don't have to do it in the olympics um, so yeah you know it's it's yeah, you're gonna you're, you're gonna get a chance. I'm, I'm assuming yeah. you're you're, yeah. you're planning I don't know. on playing. Um, yeah, exactly. It works, but you know, I left in the young age. Maybe that's why they consider me as a non-green resident. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. You've had you've had two very um, high-profile instructors in your career. So you started with David Ledbetter for a long time. Yeah. Now you're with Sean Foley, who is one of my favorite people uh, in the sort of traveling golf circus. Because every time I ask him a very simple question. It somehow ends up talking about, you know, our hearts and our minds and our chakras. Um, yeah, trust me, you'll get to talk to him for two hours for a little simple questions. It's crazy, dude. Like, I'm on yeah. the range. I'm like, how are you, Sean? He's like, well, I'm blessed and I'm feeling more motivated than ever. And then he goes yeah. into this whole thing. What yeah. percent of the work that you guys do is technical? And what percent of it is sort of like, you know, I think people like Sean and like working with Sean because he cares about the person as much as the player. Yeah. So how, how is the work that you guys kind of do? How's it balanced between technical and, and sort of mental, emotional? I think the technical side, I say last two years has been the same stuff. So not much. We don't work on much stuff. They, what we think is that nothing new comes out of my swing right now. I think we're working the same stuff. Obviously, it takes a, it takes a very long time. So we've been working the same stuff for like three, three and a half years. I'm getting a little better at it, doing on the golf course. So most of the times when he comes over to Lake Nona, where I live, where I see him most of the time, we talk for like hour and 45 minutes. We probably hit balls for like, 15 minutes out of two hour lessons you know i'll hit like maybe 50 balls max for two hours but we talk about stuff like you know if you know you know it's one of those guys you know you talk about golf and start talking about golf is more into life you know all those right i think that's been helping me a lot this year and the last year um you know he knows a lot of stuff about golf swings too like, he knows a lot of stuff but he knows also knows a lot about stuff that's that's important to golf one thing he said to me about you is he goes, the only thing that could keep him from being number one in the world is that he cares too much about being a husband and a father. He, he, he tells me and my wife the same. So, same, same. Um, so I, I mean, is there, is there some truth to that? Like, like, I don't know, maybe some of these guys, I'm not saying that Scott, Scotty seems to be a pretty good husband. And, you know, do you feel like there is a push and pull between your golf and your family life? As what I know, probably no, because. You know, he's seen many players, right? He's seen many players out there over the last 20 years, 30 years. Um, I think there's something to it. You know, definitely it, it's about the, the, the choices, right, in your life. What do you want to put a put a priority to? Um, that's why people, some people struggle when they have kids. You know, the life, the life changes, right? When you get married, when you have kids, it completely changes. So some people struggle with this. Some people like it. Personally, I really like it because they, my family kind of keeps me, um, keeps my mind off the golf a little bit when I'm kind of off the golf course and easier to kind of take my eyes away from it. So kind of you know, go into my normal life. Uh, but some people are, are not kind of that way, you know, but for me, um, you know, I, I love hanging around with my family, with my kids. I love spending time at home. Um, I also, at the same time, I try to work Do they hard travel with you. They they travel with me a few of the weeks um, where the travel is kind of easier. Um, no, not much of a time difference. Direct flies from my home. Uh, yeah, they travel with me. I I love having them around. Uh, my wife has been doing a lot of work. So, uh, how so, old are your kids? Uh, they're four and one. So you're gonna have to decide at some point whether you want to put them in like traditional. You know, I know some guys their kids are in normal school and they live a normal life. Yeah. Some people bring them with them on the road. Have you guys kind of discuss that um uh, not really but like obviously when there's school like you know i want them to go to school because my golf is not as important to them as to me you know i want them to live their normal life i want them but in the summertime you know when they have a brace and i guess it's it's perfect time you know we play in the summer most so this substance i mean we don't talk about it much but that's what i think um you know it's they definitely help me more but you know it's this isn't my job and I have to deal with, it. you know, I have to find some other way if they don't travel, you know, take, take care of my kind of mental side of it. So, you know, I, I, I love it having them, but if I don't come, you know, I don't really, you know, get disappointed or something. You know what I mean? Like just, it's just golf, right? <laughs> Why does Sean call you the weapon? I love that nickname. I hope everyone, when you guys, uh, all our listeners, when you see Ben on, oh, you man. see if you go to a tournament, you got to start calling him the weapon because it's a sick nickname. What does it mean? He he always he's been calling me weapon for the last two and a half years. Um, he really likes what I'm 
how I'm hitting on the range, uh, especially at home, you know, it's like, I want, like, you're hitting like a weapon. Like, he's a, he's, I don't miss, you know, left or right. It does exactly what he tells me to do. He loves just calling me the name. And now is like everyone else is calling me that. I, mean, I, I, I like it. It's a compliment, I guess. Dude, it's a sick nickname. It's a sick nickname. I know. Are you kidding me? The weapon? Yeah, but like, you know, I mean, Sky Scheffler, I f- feel like he's a weapon. He doesn't miss a shot. I've he doesn't seen... what? He just gets every nickname because he's the best player. No one else can yeah, have a nickname. I mean, he's a good player, right? But I, mean, I, I mean, like it. I'm kind of getting used to it, right? Like, <laughs> I am. My caddy calls me a weapon. Shell obviously calls it wep every day. You know, when he calls wep? me. He calls you yeah, wep. He goes a wep. Yeah. Sick. I love I that. Know. I don't know. Every time he, goes, he doesn't call me bed anymore, he just calls me wep. Hey, wep. Hey. <laughs> Web, then on the weapon. What is the meaning of the lobster? Uh, you know, we talk about, like I said, we talk about this mental side of golf, right? He doesn't like the war mental side, because, but um, I, I, whatever. He tells me a story. There's lobsters, you know, uh, the dominant lobsters, whatever, you know, the alpha, the lobsters. Wait, 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 wait. I know what he's about to talk about. I think yeah. I read the story. Is it about the posture? Exactly. The posture. Wow. And, uh, yeah, oh, there you go. You know the story. So, you know, he wants me to be that kind of a lobster like oh of course you know don't turn your back on because they your back is soft when you get when you turn your back on you know get like rounded or something all your mind says you know feel like you're losing it to the golf course you probably go into the deeper kind of like i say trouble you know on the golf course so he wants me to be like a like a so the story for for people who don't know is like there's all these studies that like there's a dominant lobster and then when a lobster basically gets beaten in a duel then yeah. what, like their posture changes forever is that it posture changes and the shell gets softer so they get eaten by the other lobster easier more they lose or something like that so it's like once you once you show weakness once you kind of accept weakness then you actually yeah. become weaker yeah and then your back is softer and you get killed by the other lobster that's basically huh. it. Yeah, it's Love just uh, scientifically proven. I think I, that's what he tells me, right? I just that's listen the, to the most story. Sean Foley story of all time. You're like, well, I'm getting a golf lesson. We're talking about lobsters. Yeah, um, lobsters. always. You're a uh, couple more questions. You're uh, you're active on Twitter. You like to go. You like to go back and forth with people, which is kind of interesting because, like, talking to you, you're like a very very chill guy. You don't yeah. seem like a guy who would be you know mixing it up with with bots on X. Why do you, why why do you like doing that? Whenever someone takes a shot at you, I think he, they have to be able to take him as well. You know, like I, when I want to take a shot at somebody, I, I'm ready for taking some shots into me too. So, you know, you're not, you're not very aggressive to, toward me. So you know, I don't really say yeah. back or anything. So, um, I, I like it. And I told you, the X is a very weird wall that they takes a lot of, there are a lot of weird people, a lot of nonsense out there. And, uh, I like going at them um, as much as they do toward me, but uh, I try to spend a little less time on it. I think I think it takes, like I say, it takes a lot of energies. Uh, but uh, I, I like it. I like poking at people. When they're poking at me, they gotta be ready ready to be poked at it. So that's what I do. But uh, normally, I'm very chilled. Um, I think I have a dry sense of humor sometimes. Uh, so I do. I, I, I also I'm being very sarcastic a lot of times on the Twitter. So. That's that's just me. So you're you're looking very very good to play in both the Olympics and the Presidents Cup. I wanted to ask you about the Presidents Cup because as of right now, there will yeah. be no live guys. That I confirm that. I I was looking at the list. This would this would if they did allow live guys. Okay, this would be your team. Yeah, maybe this is my yeah. prediction. Sure. Decky, Neiman, Cam Smith, Ustazen, Burmester, Adam Scott, Nick Taylor, you. Minwoo, Tom Kim, Jason Day, Sung JM. That is a squad. Okay. That's, that's a really, right. really good team. Yeah. You, you're going to lose Neiman, Smith, Oosthuizen, Burmester. Those are four guys who can contribute. I understand that it's a PGA Tour event. Yeah. But is there some part of you guys, the guys who are still playing on tour, that are like, let's, let's build the best team we can actually build and give us a chance? Because you guys have lost every single one except for one. Yeah. Why not build and and use the best players you can? That's a good question. I don't know. That's not, you know, obviously the decision is not up to me, but uh, um, like we we are missing a few players, like you said, but same for U.S. teams. I think they're missing some players. So I mean, it's the same for both sides, right? I don't think. I believe even yeah, we are we we are probably gonna miss about three players from the lift golf. But 
yeah, they will make the difference. But also, we I wouldn't it be cool like the Ryder Cup? It seems like you know this year they're just gonna have guys from everywhere because the Ryder Cup is bigger than the tours. Wouldn't that be cool right. for the international for the President's yeah, Cup I, to do that? That would be nice to have the full teams for both of them. But at one side is like uh, maybe not, so I can qualify for it. <laughs> you're <laughs> gonna qualify no matter what, dude. You're eighth in the FedEx. Yeah, you I know. Like well, you know, there are a lot of good players out there. Like Taylor won last week. You know, he's been playing good golf. Um. No, me and Lou, obviously, there's a lot of good players. You know, there's see, there there are some good players out there who can qualify, and it's not the easiest thing to do. You know, it's not, you know, it's, it's not it's not that easy. So, without them, it makes it a little easier, I guess. You know, they're less, they're a little less players. Uh, but um, it's still tough to qualify for. To be honest, that's one of my goals. Um, I don't play, you know, I don't play to qualify for it, but it definitely is like a trophy you can have. At the, at the end of the year, it's like, yeah, yeah, I qualify for the President Cup, which is a big deal for me, I think, because um, I really loved the last time when I played in 2019. That was, um, I was there. That that was an epic week. That was epic. We we are so close, I think. We're, we're very close to beating them. Yeah, and Tiger was carving shots all over that yeah, guy. Golf I mean, course was he had, sick. Just playing great, you know. He, they had a the good team. We had a great team. Um, You know, I wasn't there quite a I'm not sure, but uh, that looked amazing, too, you know. And I think I'm sure this year will be a be great again. We had a the President Cup dinner last week in Dallas. Uh, Mike was there, Camilla was there. You know, we had some talk here and there. That you know, it, it's it's I think it'll be great. Um, yeah, we we'll miss some of the guys in the Live Tour, but once the President comes, President Cup comes, I think we'll be full dialed in trying to beat those uh, U.S. teams. But um, you know, it's always a it's always it's not the easiest, I guess. You know, U.S. team on the paper has a better team, but we feel like this year being in Canada too, I think it'll help us help us more you know, beating them. But we'll see. Yeah. Uh, last question. This is just a very random question. What's your strangest superstition as a golfer? I feel like everyone's got something. I don't, I don't really have any. Like I Come really on. don't. I, I really don't. Like maybe I don't know. I use the new glove on Thursday, Friday, and change getting another new glove Saturday, Sunday. I mean, that's not even superstition. This is no, like that's more... just called being a tour pro and getting shit for free. <laughs> so I don't really have any right. That like say markers. I use any kind of quarters that I have in my bag. I have like twelve of them. I just pick up any of them. They're just um, random quarters, not a special year or no, anything. Not a just... I just get changes from somewhere. I have a bunch of quarters in my in my backpack and, and in my bag. I just pull anything out. Like I, I use regular number of tees. I use random numbers of tees. Any how well I'll probably use high numbers of golf balls. I mean, that's kind of very minor one. Well, Scotty does that and JT. I did you see this clip? He was like, because I guess Scotty uses like seven, eight, and nine. And JT oh. said he was doing like one of those sit ins on the broadcast. And he okay. was like, I don't know that the, of any other top player who uses high number balls. So JT's really? got I, I see a few of them because not many of them. I say most of them use the low numbers. The only reason I use high numbers is not many people use it because. You know, you want to be different than other guys. So you can find I the started movies. using, uh, we're tailor-made guys. I started using the picks balls because I can identify them from like a long way. Yeah, you know, the exactly. ones that have like, that's the whole yeah. point of different numbers, different markers. So I use high numbers. I see someone do it, but I don't really have a superstition. Probably if I really have to be picky, maybe when I put, when I'm putting it well, I, like that, because I usually cut my nails at once a week. Okay. But I probably don't cut my nails until the tournament finishes. Like when I'm starting to putt well. That's a weird one. That's definitely that's a, a weird, weird one. So I don't want to change my feelings in my head, you know, like that kind of stuff. My, that's what, what I learned from my parents. My parents never try to cut the nails during the tournament, they say. They said, once well, you're yeah, in, if you're playing table tennis, it's like, you know. Well, putting is a very, you know, delicate and emotion. So, totally. Yeah, yeah grip so, pressure, all that stuff matters. Yeah. That's, that's, some, that's some, something I can think of. But other than that, I'm very, I don't have, I, I'm not the OCD type of player, you know. I, <laughs> I don't really have anything special. That's, Yes, I'm very. Boring. I think I think, the, I think the fingernails counts. So next time what? someone asks you that answer, that question, there's your answer. Well, thank you very much, Ben. I appreciate like- it. It was nice to get to speak to you. I feel like we've interacted a few times online, and it's never yep. I, you can never read tone or anything. Yeah. So it's nice. It's nice to finally connect. You're obviously playing fantastic this year. Right. Um, you played great last. I was. I was. You know, we we booked this last week, so I was. I was rooting for you last week because it's always oh, more fun when the guy it. comes off a top five finish yeah, um, definitely. Yeah. than when he doesn't. So rooting for you this week uh, at Quail Hollow. Guys, if, you, if you're if you out there, he's the weapon. His name is Wep. Oh, his name God. is not Ben or Byung Han. It's Wep. And uh, good luck this week and a major next week. So Thanks, um, Thanks. we'll talk again soon, dude. All right, man. Thanks.
How are you? Is it hot over there? I'm great. Yeah, hot and humid. Yeah. Welcome to the American South. Have you <laughs> uh, had you spent much time in the South, like before getting your card and stuff? No, like uh, South. You mean close to Texas and stuff like this, or just South of the country? Like Southeast. When we say the South, we mean like yeah, like um, you know, Alabama, Florida, North Carolina, yeah. South Carolina, that that kind of area. Yeah, Florida. Yes, uh, this is where I am. Uh, this is where uh, this is where I practice. I practice in West Palm. Where where do you did you get a membership out there somewhere? Yeah, I got my membership at the Dyke Preserve. Oh, nice! We did and a video. Am, uh, Bush, were you with us that day when we filmed with Shane Lowry? Yeah, that course is sweet. We did a video with Shane Lowry out there. It's a great golf course. Yeah, it's uh, it's super nice for me. To be fair, it's uh, one of the best in the area. I really like the surrounding, the very natural. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, guys, that's kind of how we do it. We jumped right in. Uh, we are joined by Matthew Pavone. You're number 20 in the world right now. You're number nine in the FedEx Cup. This time last year, you were not on the, you were playing on the European tour. You weren't even really that close to getting your PGA tour card. What have the last six, seven months been like for you? Well, a uh, little bit of a roller coaster, right? Um, lots of emotions, different ones. It's, uh, yeah, it really shows that with uh, hard work and uh, in patience, everything can go pretty quick in golf. I think it can really happen in both way, and for me, it was on the right way. Um, winning my first DP tour, even after seven years on tour, was really big for me. It was like not we can't really say consecration, but that was something really big because you always feel. I always felt like I had the game to win on tour, but before you you've actually done it, you're not sure a hundred percent. So this is where. Uh, it all started for me, yeah. You've got to be pretty tired. I was looking at your schedule. You keep <laughs> on going back over there. I mean, yeah, well, I, I, went, I understand, I, I I understand that you you went back. So you, you won your third start at Torrey Pines, which got you into everything. You know, yeah. you're, you're playing the majors. You're playing the signature events. Whereas it, and then I looked at your schedule, and you went back. You played in Singapore, and then you came back to the U.S., and you played in Japan, and you came back to the U.S. Yeah. Is that because you committed to those tournaments before? or like, Were you not planning on playing all of these tournaments in America? Yeah, I mean, uh, Japan was definitely something uh, I wanted to do because of my sponsor, ISPS. That was really important for them to have their ambassador to the tournament, so that was, um, that was important for me to go. It's also like a country that I was really looking forward to visit and uh, enjoy because uh, I've played my first tournament in Japan last year and I really loved it. Uh, it's really a country of, uh, of great values, really respectful people, very natural golf courses. And uh, that's a country I, I'm really like to go and play. So that was that was really easy. And uh, and I mean, I have to, to play some tournaments also to keep my membership on the on the um, on DP World, and I felt like Singapore was uh, was nice because uh, I had a top ten the previous year on that uh, on that uh, tournament, and I did it again this year. So definitely a golf course that suits my game, and that was just the right time for me to uh, to come back, see my friends, uh, enjoy a nice a uh, nice restaurant with them, share a little bit of my experience on the first two three months on the PGA Tour. Yeah, you've got a lot to talk about. You've got a lot yeah. to talk about. It's like I wonder if like. When you go back and you hang out with uh, with your friends from the from DP World Tour, they're like, "Oh, Mister Big Shot, oh Tory Pines." <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's just it's just nice to to talk about how how big is the PJ Tour, how it works, because it's different than what we are used to. So it's just nice for them to understand the differences, and also about like the how the tournaments are played like are they tougher than in europe like the feel and stuff it's just some of the stuff that they really have to understand and if are I they can... tougher i was going to ask this because you know the, this program where the, the the top players on the dp world tour get pga tour cards is relatively new and you guys are playing very well i mean a lot of you guys are playing very very well you're having a great season nikolai who you beat um is obviously doing very very well and it seems to be that you know maybe the gap between the DP World Tour and the PGA Tour, at least at the top level, isn't quite as wide as we might have thought. What's been your impression? Because you've come over and you've had success right away. I think like the density of the players on the PGA Tour, it's bigger than in Europe for sure. Like when you have a so-so week, you really drop spots like very quickly on the PGA Tour. 
So you're saying so, like if a week that would finish like 20th in DP World Tour, you might you might miss the cut. Well, you might miss the cut, or you might finish below, uh, down below in the cut, bottom of the cut. So yeah, that's the difference. But I I still feel like I have a lot of friends in Europe that I'm sure if they got the, a chance to play on the PGA Tour for full season, they'd do great because I really feel like when you are having a good week, wherever it's on the PGA Tour on or on DP, you can get a really good result. Right, but it's just it's a function of yeah, it's an interesting point. Like you had a you had a full season. You knew that it wasn't like okay, if I miss this cut, I'm like this is my only chance, and that probably yeah. gave you some freedom. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's that's the main thing. Before we had this agreement with the PGA Tour, uh, we were only coming to the uh, to America what like one to three times a year. So you felt like if you're not doing great right away, it's it's gone. So that that was tough, and also with the world ranking point, I mean, being able to get to the top fifty in the world only playing on DP World Tour was quite tough. Um, where did you live when you were playing in Europe? Uh, in Andorra, in the slopes, small country in between France and Spain. Andorra, I yeah. only know that from like uh, you know Euro qualifiers. I've never yeah. actually like seen that country. Just heard about this football skiing team. place, skiing place. So that's very different from Florida. It is. It is big so time how, different. Yeah. How are you adjusting to to life in the United States and and life in you know kind of that West Palm Jupiter area where so many golfers live? I love it. It's uh, it's like being in Disneyland for me, but <laughs> it's not. It's not only a weekend. It's uh, uh, a full time now. I know it's so great. I mean, what you dream about since you kid is like playing the best golf course you can, playing the biggest tournament, and ob- obviously I'm practicing with top players every week now, which make the the Monday games with the boys really really interesting compared to maybe some that I had at home with uh, with just my friends. Your dad is a professional soccer player or was a professional soccer player we had ben on on the show earlier and he his parents were ping pong players table tennis i think you know playing first division football in france might be a little bit cooler than than table tennis what was it like having a dad uh was he famous when you were growing up yeah 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 he was he was quite famous the the city where i come from i mean he was the captain of the of the team uh where we come from he, he won the fr- and uh so Toulouse is where I'm born, but where we live the most of the time was Bordeaux, okay. and uh, he was a lot the of captain. wine in Bordeaux. Yeah, that's uh, that's the place, right? Uh, so he was the captain of the team, and they won the French championship in '98, '99. So winning the French championship is like for American people winning the Super Bowl, kind of. So when you have the captain of the Super Bowl uh, uh, as your dad, is uh, it's pretty pretty big. Wait, so you're telling me that teams other than PSG used to win the for, used to win League One? Yeah. It wasn't just always yeah, PSG I mean, every single time. Since uh, since Qatari guys uh, started uh, to invest money in into PSG, it really made the stuff. Uh, I mean, the championships are a little bit harder to win. <laughs> I was gonna ask your dad never got a cap for France, but he played yep. in the late '90s, so like Vieira, Makaleli, yeah. Zidane, like those were some good players. Pe- people, the golf people listening to this, were like, "What are you talking about?" But he, those were some great French midfielders. Yeah, it was. It was like uh, for that World Cup that the France won uh, with Zidane and everything. He was like on the pre-list, like the best thirty or thirty-two players. But in the end, they only got twenty-four or twenty-six, something like this, and he hasn't made it. But uh, a lot of great players at that time. So I want to go back to the end of last year when you got your card at the end of the year. Even that was dicey. You, you, you made four birdies in a row to finish. You birdied the last. Rasmus Hoygaard probably hates your guts because your birdie knocked him out of a PGA Tour card. What was that day like? Because I have to imagine like that pressure of knowing, okay, this is... Because if you finished one spot back, you get nothing. Right, it's not like you get like some starts. It's like you're either on the PGA Tour for a whole year or nothing. What was that afternoon like? Yeah, that was uh, same. That was a special day. I I kind of knew I had to make a top five uh, to get there. This is what I kind of set up as a goal for my week. And then I started my Sunday really good. I was like three under after seven, and I was like, oh, that's nice being it in the mix on the final round. Like for something you you really want to achieve, it's nice. It's always nice. And then I kind of kind of dropped one or two shots, and I was like getting away from it. And uh, I kind of arrive on fifteen, and I see my my guy Roman Longas, French guy, 
who is making a move that day and I see him in, in the top five at that time and I was like he was like three shots away from me and I was like okay come on let's let's try to catch Romain four holes I was playing great I was like try just trying to make two or three birdies and we'll see what's gonna happen and then I make one on 15 then one on 16 then one on 17 and I show up on 18 and I was like Wow, dude, listen, if you make Burry on the last, you're going to probably go to the PGA Tour next year. And on that tee shot, and I was playing so great that day. And I it's that reachable shot. par five, right? If you hit it down yeah, the fairway, you can get there? Yeah, that's reachable par five, but it's a little bit tricky because you have a little bit of water in the middle of the fairway, like sneaking a little bit in the middle of the yeah, fairway. Yeah, I feel like a lot of guys hit it way left and then just hit a wedge and a wedge on the green. Yeah. Or like so a what, six iron and a wedge. What happened is I tried to hit the fairway, but on, on the top of the, my backswing, I was like, I was scared to hit in the water. So I shut my hands and I hit Been that 40 yards pull in the, in the trees on the left, but it's pretty clear. And after I just chip it out and I get, get myself a nice number for a wedge and I stick it to I don't know like four foot five foot four foot probably and when I was on top of that putt I was like that was probably the longest putt I have I've, I have ever had <laughs> that four footer made, was really was scary it, do you make it in the middle or did it kind of lip in no nah, no it was straight in the middle that's a well that that feeling of looking up and seeing that ball going in the hole must oh, have yeah. been something special yeah, but you're so happy at that time because you achieved something great. I mean, four birdie on the last four to get to where you want it. And then at the same time, you don't know the points. You don't know who's, who is playing great on the golf court or not. There are like a few more games behind you. And then after that, the, the, the wait starts and you're like trying to see the projected and stuff like this. Am I in? Am I out? Everybody tells you you're in, but you're like, no, shut up. Just just wait till the last guy is done with his game, and uh, in the end, it was uh, it was just in. So that was uh, that was incredible. Yeah, you like to you like to make it close. I mean, you finished you finished t twelfth at the Masters, which gets you in next year, no matter what else happens. Um, I wanted to talk to you about that week. I read a story that your mother left a coin. Can you tell our listeners that story? Yeah. So for my dad's four years birthday, my dad likes to play golf, and my my mom, my mom wanted to bring him to what's the best like tournament in the world to give my my dad a little bit of, uh, a little bit of insight and see what's the best of the best and they got tickets uh from i think uh Jose Maria Ola Sabal uh they got tickets to uh, to go to the masters and uh they spent one of the most amazing uh, week of their life because master is always special and my mom before leaving i can't remember the day but she she kind of buried a coin uh, next to the range or uh, just uh, next to a tree, and uh, she made that kind of uh, kind of a wish of uh, of getting back with his son uh, playing into the. So master. you were already you were already playing in tournaments and stuff. Yeah, I was. I, I think I was still amateur. I was still amateur, but she she just made that wish, saying that she wanted to come back as uh, with me as a player in ten years time. So when I won Tori. I didn't know I was in the Masters, and the guys at the press conference. How do you not know say, that? That's like the I first got, thing you'd think about. No, I I think it was world ranking. I, I didn't yeah. know like winning on the PGA Tour got you straight in the Masters. And uh, that guy at the press conference uh, said to me like, well, "Wow, you must be really excited to to go at your first Masters." And I was, "Oh, really?" And the first thing I did after the press conference is calling my mom and I said, "Listen, mom, we're going back to the Masters, but it's not." 10 year after you buried that cone, but 14. So I'm really sorry. You I'm know 15. what? Worth the wait. Worth the wait, I think. <laughs> oh, you know, some was. things in life. It was. Some things in life are worth the wait. Um, you're a tattoo guy. I'm a tattoo guy. I've got a bunch on my arms. There's not many of us in golf. Um, what is the origin of the tattoos? And I know you have one pretty special on your hand. Yeah, I have, I have many. Uh, it probably comes from the the football uh the football side like all those football guy have tattoos i don't know why i got into your dad it, have I, tattoos he hates it so <laughs> my dad too my dad too he hates it so i don't know uh i have like uh from chest to to the elbow i have a, a french polynesian side which is close to the maori you know new zealand guy fijian all the symbols have meaning they are really like great attitude and fighting spirits into into games, so uh, I really find myself into it. And then I have um, a side which uh, more from uh, Aztec, 
Aztec, Mayans, and uh, Peruvian side because uh, I don't know since I'm kid, me, my dad, my grandmother, we are all really liking the south of uh, America. And my dream actually is to go to Peru and climb the Machu Picchu. I think so, you can do it this off season. You made enough money for sure. Yeah. So uh, yeah, this is where it comes from. Also, I am from a Spanish family background. My grandpa was Spanish. So I don't know, maybe part of uh, something in my blood. I have to check. And what's the one on the hand? Because this one got a lot of play uh, when you won. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to get like uh, a sentence which got meanings for me. And I was looking on internet about what I, can, I could get and what's a little bit different than everyone has. And I found that sentence which said, the saliva that flows now will become the tears of joy tomorrow. And uh, it says it comes from Harvard. And uh, it was written by students uh, in the, on the library on the walls. Uh, and uh, I'm sure it says saliva because over there it's not really physical, but it's more about the conferences and the actual saliva you have to... Uh, to produce and use for the studies uh but yeah it's really meaningful because uh, in golf the work you put every day the sweat you your 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 doing is uh will become just uh, tears when you when you lift up uh, lift up a trophy have you spoken to luke donald <clears throat> have you spoken to luke donald yet you know are you you're sort of you've worked yourself into that picture are you thinking about i mean obviously it, it's not for another year and a half but are you excited to kind of make a charge for that team it's it's a dream Winning a major, being part of the Ryder Cup, uh, it's uh, it's a dream. I mean, there are so many great European players. Uh, I'm sure in a year and a half time, it can change a lot. So all I can do is really focus on the process. This is what I've been focused on the last the last few years. Uh, really investing in my team, making it, trying to make the right decisions and work hard. And we will see in the next September. I got um, I got a nice surprise and uh, tee up in America. What are you like as a golfer? Are you angry out there? Are you intense? Do you joke around? If I, if I put a microphone on you and your caddy, what, what what would you guys talk about? A little bit everything. A little bit everything. I'm not cold-blooded, uh, for sure. Uh, I learned a lot about managing my emotions. Um, but uh, a little bit of everything. I like joke with my caddy. We can t- talk about absolutely everything. But at the same time, I can complain. At the same time, I have periods where I can be really quiet. I'm... Uh, I'm a mix of a little bit everything. And do you have any, we like to ask everybody, do you have any superstitions, any weird things that you do? You know, golfers, Ben On was telling us earlier today that when he's putting well, he doesn't cut his nails. So oh, wow. do you, is, that's a, and he was like, I don't know if this is weird, but I was, and then he tells me, I was like, yeah, that's, that's definitely weird. Um, do you have anything like that? Whether it's a ball marker or, you know, certain things. And the thing is, uh, I'm really related to the number seven. Okay. Like, like, uh, my dad has the seventh jersey during his career. Uh, he's born November the seventh, so it's really like a number that I kept in my heart. Uh, when I won the Spanish Open the Saturday night, uh, I was parked on the like uh, the two hundred and eighty fifth spot, and the guy from the security said to me, "You have to move your car because there is a guest coming at your spot, and I'm moving you to the seventh. And I was like, "Goosebumps, baby! Perfect." Perfect. The tournament is for me, and I won that tournament, right? And uh, also, when I was in Tori, the Saturday night, we went to that nice Italian restaurant with uh, my physio, Jeremy, and uh, the guy put us at the table seven. And the Sunday of the tournament, that was the seventh birthday of my uh, son's physio. A lot of sevens going on. So it ended being like, I only have seven balls in my bag. <laughs> that's where that's where the whole story goes to. I thought you were gonna say that. I thought you were gonna say that you use the number seven, or you have just seven balls in the no, bag. Seven balls in the bag, and it started from Torrey Pine. Well, good thing you're a good golfer because some people when they go to TPC <laughs> Sawgrass, you know, seven balls in the bag is. Did you put a few extra that week? I didn't. I was just aiming to the fat puff. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Oh, last thing I wanted to ask you: Do you wear the sun sleeves for sun protection or to protect the tattoos or both? A uh, little bit of both. Uh, I I have a tattoo on my uh, on my left uh, forearm, and uh, I want to do I want to put more ink inside because when I did that did that was last summer and I was sweating a lot so some parts of the tattoo are very light and I want to make sure I get that ink inside so uh, I just want to protect it uh, till I get it done so this is why I, I started to wear the sleeves last summer 
and I won twice with them, so now I just keep them anyway. I was gonna say maybe maybe keep the sleeves on. Yeah, I I I've changed them. I'm not the same. They are okay, different good. ones, different brands every time. You wash them? But hey, this is not like a unique model. No, good. I hope not. But like, you're kind of the sleeves guy. Like no one else wears them, so it's kind of your thing. I think you should keep it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm fine with this. It's uh, it's uh, a lot better than adding su- sunscreens like twice or th- uh, three times a realm. I completely agree. I'm doing the Stand same by. thing. I'm starting to wear them now. Um, well, by. thank you so much. You got a big couple weeks coming up. You got Quail Hollow this week. You got Valhalla next week. You're hanging out in the south. Um, enjoy yourself this week, and uh, we'll see you. I'll see you next week. I'll be out there at Valhalla. Yeah, cool. I'm in uh, very exciting weeks ahead, so I can wait. Uh, for me, every day... I mean, every week it's a it's a new tournament, new place. I'm like uh, like a kid going at the, his first day of of school. So it's a it's pretty fun. It's really fun. Yeah, but it's good to it's good to be in your first day of school when you've already you know won on the tour and you're already yeah. into everything. Like you have it, some job security. I'm sure there's a lot of your better. a lot of your buddies from Europe that are starting to fucking feel it right now. They're like, okay, I got to start playing good. Yeah, I mean, I I hope I, if. If my story can help sp- uh, people over there, I'd be really happy. And as I said, there are like so many great players over there. And I'm sure, I mean, it's all about opportunities. They have to get the chance to play here in America. But I'm sure with those 10 spots, you will see more and more European guys coming in America and doing well. I'm, I'm sure about that. I love seeing it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Matthew. Thanks, Dan. Pleasure. 